Hi, good afternoon and welcome to this, uh, this meeting of the Charity Trustee Subcommittee. Welcome to members of the public in here. And I, I think that's a first that we started bang on two o'clock there, well, just as the clock stopped chiming and we started. Uh, I think just before we, we, we'll go around and we'll introduce people, uh, I'll just read through a, a housekeeping arrangements and welcome information. The meeting's open to the public today uh, and uh, it will be webcast. However, Appendix 1 uh, item to item six on the agenda. It's not available to the public or the press because it contains exempt information uh, relating financial and business affairs. So if members wish to discuss the information in this appendix, we'll need to ask members of the public and press to kind of leave for that part of the meeting and we'll pause the webcast. What we'll try and do is, is talk in general terms, but if there are any questions on there, if we try and keep those and we'll, we'll, if we have to, then we'll pause uh, as we go through there. We've received 11 questions from uh, three members of the public uh, and we'll consider these under item five on the agenda. And can I please request that all mobile telephones and any such equipment are switched to silent mode so as not to disturb the conduct of the meeting. And this is where everybody suddenly grabs the phone and start checking how things in there. So uh, there's no fire test planned for today. If there is an emergency evacuation, please take instruction from the town hall staff up there in the gallery and the assembly point is at Tudor Square. Uh, for the benefit of the webcast, I'll ask each member of the charity subcommittee in turn to introduce themselves. I'll start with me, then we'll move around and we'll ask the officers as well. Uh, my name is Councillor Brian Lodge, member for Burley Ward, uh, chair of the charity trustee subcommittee. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councillor Julie Gilkirk, member for the Stocksbridge and Upton Ward. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councillor Mick Rooney, newly appointed to this committee, and I represent Woodhouse Ward. Okay. Um, yep, Douglas Johnson, City Ward, um, Green Group person. Good afternoon. I'm Richard Williams, a member for Spannington Ward. And if we can ask the officers, if we start, Ruth, and we'll go and then we'll come in. Um, I'm Ruth Bell, Head of Parks and Countryside. Afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Smith, Director of Di Direct Services. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nachman Ali, and I'm the Executive Director of Operational Services. Uh, Craig Rogerson, Democratic Services. Sarah Bennett, Assistant Director for Legal and Governance. And Ryan Keyworth, Director of Finance and Commercial Services. Thank you. And just on the end, we have someone supporting us with the webcast. Sorry, Jay Bell, Democratic Services, looking after the webcasting today. Always gets missed off. <laughs> Keeps a low profile. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, item two on the agenda is apologies for absence. Not received, Chair. Okay. Item three, exclusion of the press and public. As I indicated, appendix one on item six on the agenda is not available. And as I explained, if we need to discuss that, then we'll have to ask the press and public to leave and pause the, the webcasting. Uh, any declarations of interest? No, nope, it appears to be a declaration of interest. So we'll move on to item five, which is public questions and petitions. Uh, we've received a number from Andy Kershaw. Andy, if you'd like to move to the microphone. Uh, apologies if it's if prior to the, the, the webcast starting, Andy was just making reference okay. that previously it's been down here. What we're trying to do is bring the meetings back into the, the formal way they were operated before and in the council chamber, the way the webcams are set up, is not always brilliant for spread out across the chamber. Okay. But Andy, if you want to ask your Thank questions. You. Thank you, Chair. Um, as it's the first meeting of the Charity Trust Subcommittee, uh, forgive me if I cover some ground which uh, some people may have heard uh, previously. Um, the Rose Garden Cafe, which we're all here about today, has been part and parcel of Gross Park uh, as a cafe and a pavilion since 1927, and it was built with funds provided by J.G. Graves himself, and it was suddenly closed by this council on the 27th of July this year with 15 minutes notice to the 12 staff who successfully operated the cafe for the operator's brew kitchen over the last 14 years, who've since lost their jobs as a result. That's uh, 12 staff, 90 days they've been without employment as a result of this, since these people lost their jobs. And they, really, this council needs to hang its head in shame uh, that fact, that one single fact that 12 staff have been without employment, especially uh, for people who claim to be trade unionists in this chamber. 
They've been offered no compensation for losing their jobs as a direct result of the collective incompetence and negligence of Sheffield Council. And I'm hoping to hear some words of compassion for them today, if nothing else. And uh, Mr. Chairman, Julie Collins from the uh, Rose Garden Cafe, the manager of the cafe, is here. And with your permission, I'd like her to just to say a few words about the impact uh, on the staff after I've finished. The council relied upon a surveyor's report done on the 28th of June, which they'd sat on for five weeks before taking any action to, to declare it unsafe, after it revealed what turned out to be a, a sort of shocking laundry list, if you like, of disrepair and problems going back years and years to the external fabric and structure of the building, including the roof, the windows, the soffits, and a host of other defects justifying, in the council's view, its sudden closure. The fact, and this is our position, the fact that this building was allowed to reach this disgraceful and neglected state without any major repairs or maintenance over the last 14 years at least, and possibly further, has not yet been fully explained to us. It's not been explained to the people of Sheffield, to the ratepayers, it's certainly not been explained to anyone, and possibly uh, it's not been justified since the council are the trustee, trustees of the park, and it's assets such as this, and, and despite having responsibility under the lease agreement for external and structural repairs and maintenance over the, that period, nothing has been done to it, despite thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds being spent on the council's other priorities in the park. And the situation was quite clear from 2018, a report from a previous surveyor asking for urgent action on disrepair in the cafe, and yet it was allowed to be leased to the cafe operator until 2022 when it reached this crisis point. And it's one of those questions that we are still waiting, awaiting answers to. Why was this cafe allowed to get to that point, at least by 2018, which they knew about, and leading to its sudden closure in July of 2022? And following that sudden and brutal closure, which shocked the local community and the people of Sheffield. We organised a public meeting in Grace Park to which more than 200 people, I think, uh, turned up to express their anger and upset at the loss of what is a much used, a much uh, loved and well used and popular facility, which not only provides food and refreshments uh, to people, to parents, to walkers, to visitors and the like, but from all over the city and beyond. It's the largest park in Sheffield. And it acts as a critically important social hub for people, for many older people, socially isolated, as it did during COVID, and Julie will explain further. Uh, they treasure it as a meeting place to uh, a, a, building which, a, a building which in its present state has played a critical part in their lives. It's played a critical part in my life and the life of all the people sat here today and the 11,000 nearly people who've signed that petition to save it from demolition and closure. They came together on the 4th of August to demand the repair and reopening of this cafe and to expressly state their opposition to its demolition. Now, at the same time, a young mum working professional uh, named Liz Nat from Norton, who's with us, can't be with us today, but who uses the park and cafe with her kids, launched the petition to save the Rose, Rose, Rose Garden Cafe from demolition. It's now got the more than, as I say, 10,500 signatures, and it's still growing, and we plan to present that petition to uh, the full council on the 2nd of November. Liz and our campaign are going to be here, and all along the path of this sorry mess, the council's had a trail of negative publicity on air and in print when it could have been so positive. And no doubt the report from this meeting in the Sheffield Star tomorrow, if uh, the press are here, won't be very comforting either. At the public meeting, uh, I can see him down here, and both of them, in fact, we were given assurances by uh, Ajman Ali and Tom Smith, and later by the leader, Council, Councillor Terry Fox, that the cafe would not be demolished and no decisions had been taken and that the council would work with all the stakeholders, including the Save the Rose Garden Cafe campaign and the Friends of Graves Park, towards a solution for the building. Now, our demands are very simple, and they were and they remain very simple. Get in, prop up the building, get a new survey done, including the roof timbers, identify all the defects and problems, and come together to... Uh, tell us what the cost will be and work with the campaigners and the friends group and local people to raise funds for the full repair and reinstatement of the building. From sources we've identified already, from the local area committee who pledged uh, 10,000 to 20,000, from Beechiff and Greenhill and from Grace Park, 
uh, and from sill allocations. And we dearly hope that, and I say this to the officers, we want to see a bid to the council's own capital programme to reinstate this building to its former state before the rot was allowed to set in and get it reopened again. We don't just want it to left to community fundraising, the LAC and other sources of external funding like the lottery. We want to see the council putting its share of the wedge in towards its repair and reinstatement. Mr Chairman, it's taken three months to reach the point where contractors were finally sent in yesterday to, re uh, to uh, undertake the propping up operation after a design scheme was agreed by officers. Why has it taken so long to do this? A whole summer of activity lost uh, in this cafe. A whole summer of jobs and people made redundant. Well, we're now sitting down with officers, thankfully, to discuss a way forward for the cafe building. And no doubt you'll hear uh, well, uh, well sort of worn phrases like end of life and not financially viable and not value for money by officers to, to justify demolition and maybe a proposal to, to knock it down and build a characterless building to be let out to a willing tenant at a new highly inflated rent so that the council can get its money back or bring in some of those shipping containers which have been su such a success in the city centre. Sorry, sorry, and, and I'm, I'm conscious of... Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm coming to, to an get end. to the questions now, if you can, yep. please. The question is, why, why... And there's yet to be another consultation exercise about the future of the cafe, which is frustrating for local people, since 11,000 people have made their views known and there's been no consult council consultation in history that's had 11,000 respondees. Why are we about to embark on another consultation exercise which will mean more delay. The fact is that we want this building saved, repaired, reopened. There's no other option is good enough for the 11,000 people who've signed the petition, who've joined our campaign from all over the city. Graves Park deserves better from the council. It's a poor system, this, for accessibility for citizens in this city. We've had to go through the fog of several committees, finance sub, charity trusts, strategy and resources. No doubt we'll have to attend the Parks and Neighbourhoods Committee for have a, to, uh, to have our say at that as well. It, it is a Byzantine system for citizens to negotiate their way through this. And yet, if the council has an urgent priority, it can bring it at a, a, at a couple of days' notice and get a decision made. So it's self-serving for the council, this system. And you might want to look at the example of the Rose Garden Cafe as an example of how the new committee system applies to a single issue and how citizens negotiate their way around this Byzantine system. It's not accessible or user-friendly. It's got no method for dealing with urgent issues raised by people and communities. The council, as I say, can do it themselves. Now, on the good news, we've applied for an uh, 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 asset of community value and for the cafe to be... Uh, 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 entered on the local heritage register and uh, we are interested in the council supporting us with that building being listed to protect it from demolition and uh, mr chairman i'm not going to repeat the questions again but you have them in front of you uh, how the, how does the council discharge its duty as a corporate trustee why uh, has the building not been maintained over those years? Will the council re uh, re reveal the funding model for Grey Sparkle and exactly which staff are accounted for? And how the council squares its duty to care for and maintain charitable assets in Grace Park in the light of the finding of the fact that no maintenance has been done for years and years and years on this cafe? Our view is no demolition, full repair and reinstatement, and reopening as soon as possible. Let's not waste time on another consultation exercise. And you have the questions in front of you. And if I may, Mr Chairman, allow a couple of minutes for Julie Collins just to talk about the impact of uh, this closure on her and the 12 staff who've been made redundant. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. If you, if you can sort of just be, yeah, of be brief on it now. Yeah. Well, I was, I was working that day, the 27th of July, and within uh, we got a phone call, and within half an hour, there were some security guys up to uh, the cafe and said, we've got 15 minutes to get out. Can you get your belongings? Can you get your personal possessions? I've got a cafe full of people. I've got staff looking at me, not knowing what's happening. I tried to, you know, I did my best. I got everybody out. But there was optimism because we were working with the council. They said they were going to put some temporary unit in place. So I told the staff, nothing to worry about. We've just got some repairs that need doing. And as time went on and went on, staff have been asking me what's happening. We've all been out of work. Um, 
the community are at a loss. We served these people through COVID. We opened our doors after about 60 days and people came in and um, it was a solace and a place for people to come. And I walk around the park now twice, at least twice a day. I'm either running in the park, walking the dog, and I can't walk without people asking me what's happening with the cafe. They've just lost these people. A coffee cart won't suffice it. They need somewhere to sit and have a chat. Some people of the community never saw anybody for the rest of the day. Older people, people that had been caring for the husbands that had passed away. Um, a coffee cart just won't suffice at all. Um, so I'm hoping that you really can listen to what the community is saying. There is hope and we are working with people and we do like a little bit of what we're hearing. We just need some movement and we need something doing quickly. Winter is coming and with, there is hope that with this structure that we have been talking and the council have been talking with Brew Kitchen that there is some optimism for us to be able to get in and serve and we're willing to do that whether it be a takeaway capacity or whether it just be a sitting we are wanting this community needs us to be there and we're hoping that that just isn't false hope for us thank you uh, Thank you, Julie. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure colleagues around here in the, in the current climate where everybody's facing difficulties with the, the cost of living that we're facing for, for yourself and your colleagues working there to be in this situation. I think we all understand how difficult that is. And I hope we can arrive at some solution with the uh, with your employers as, to, to, to get something back in there as soon as possible. Uh, we will cover some more of those as we go through the report. And we'll answer some of those questions in there. But what I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll summarise the questions you've submitted, Andy, and the, the answers for the benefit of people who are watching on the, on the webcast and for the purpose of the minutes. Uh, so question one was, please explain how the council discharges its statutory duty as sole corporate trustee. The council is a corporate trustee, uh, and it's delegated its responsibility to the charity trustee subcommittee. The members of the committee exercise those responsibilities jointly and with decisions carried by a majority. So each member of the five us here, we're not individual trustees. The council is the trustee. We exercise the responsibilities through the committee. Uh, question two was explain the funding revenue generated in Grace Park has been applied and why the Rose Garden Cafe has not benefited from any repairs or maintenance in the last 20 to 20 years uh, and who's responsible. Uh, the revenue generated within Grace Park has been spent within the park and that it's been on maintenance and management of the green space within the park. The council is responsible for maintaining the structure and the external elements of the Rose Garden Cafe. Repairs and maintenance have taken place at the Rose Garden Cafe when the issues have been reported by the occupants and the council staff. Uh, whilst the previous condition report in 2018 highlighted the roof was in a poor state of repair, the recommendation was considered but no action was taken at that time. A further survey didn't take place until the most recent ones in 2022. Uh, there will be further information that we'll, we'll provide in writing to Andy in response to that, that gives a little bit more about the financial situation and the accounts that are in there. Question three, will the committee support the full repair and reinstatement of the Rose Garden Cafe in accordance with the wish of the petition? Uh, we appreciate the strength of feeling that's, that's regarding the future of the cafe. However, as a trustee, the council must act in the charity's best interest uh, within the, the objects of the charity, and we have to manage the resources responsibly. As a committee of the council, the charity, sub, charity trustee subcommittee must make decisions on the basis of all the relevant information. And as you'll see within the recommendations where, uh, for the report, as we discuss further, we are, we are seeking clarification and, and from the Charities Commission. It's currently too early in the process of the committee to be able to do all these things, and so it's not possible at this time for the committee to give the formal uh, the, the, the response that you're requesting there. But I can reassure you that we are looking through, and as you see in the recommendation of the report, we are seeking steps to what we can do to, to preserve the cafe and go through. It was interesting that you said there, Andy, just before I'm on the next question, you, you've advised that you've submitted a listing uh, for the building. Uh, it's one of the things that my colleagues within the the, the sorry, Labour Group... Asset of Community Babylon, oh, sorry, Asset of Community Babylon and Local Heritage local Listing. Heritage. Local Heritage Listing. It's one of the things that my colleagues within the Labour Group were looking and thinking about this 
as a listing for a listed building. Uh, there are differences of opinion about architectural merit. You know, there are people that view Cole Brothers building quite strongly as architectural merit. Might see things differently at Rose Garden Cafe, but uh, it's one of the things that, that we have considered in looking through. And we have, uh, as a councillor for Stocksbridge, uh, Janet Riddler, as the heritage champion, is quite prepared. I don't know if you, you want to say more on this, Councillor Grocock. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Riddler joined the council in the elections in... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Councillor Wrigley joined the, um, the council in May, she's on holiday this week, um, as a, a, a colleague of mine in Stocksbridge and Upper Dome, she's our heritage champion, um, she has a lot of, she's done a lot of work and has quite an, um, a, a personal and professional interest in these sort of things, she's been talking to us as Labour Group about the benefits of listing the building in terms of the protections that that would give to the building, the opportunities that that would bring in terms of looking at um, funding for the building in the future. So that's something that, you know, we are um, keen to explore with you. And I think it, it, it was important before we came to any decision today um, as a group, we wanted to make sure we had this meeting today so that we weren't preempting anything as a group and we were listening to what the community got to say before we made any um, specific decisions with regard to that. But that's just to give you a, a, a view of where our thinking has been um, over the last couple of months in, in relation to the cafe. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I hope that provides a little bit of reassurance in there. And whilst we can't, that, that's a, a listing submission which is not on behalf of the council. It's a listing submission that Janet's looking at and, and going through and working through. These things do take quite a bit of work to put together. So uh, if, if we are to proceed with that, then I'm sure Janet will be working with the local community groups involved up there to look at uh, developing a, a proposal to put forward for a listing on there. Uh, question four, will the council reveal the precise details of the funding model for Grace Park and exactly which staff are accounted for in the account of expenditure submitted to the Charit Charities Commission? Sheffield City Council is the sole trustee of the charity and funding is either restricted or unrestricted. Unrestricted funds are available for use at the discretion of the trustees uh, in furtherance of the general objectives of the charity and that largely relates from income from, from activities within the park and income generated in the park. Restricted funds are those issued in accordance with specific restrictions by donors or which have been raised by the charity for a specific purpose. Uh, any de deficit arising between the expenditure and funding each year is met by Sheffield City Council. We will provide further information uh, in writing to you. It, it would be a little bit difficult to just sit in and read out a, a list of figures in a spreadsheet. We will provide that to you and it will be incorporated within the minutes of this meeting so it will be on the public record that's there for you. Uh, question five, will the committee support a recommendation for a scheme change to the Grace Park Charity to enable local ward councillors and local stakeholder representatives become trustees of Grace Park. We are committed to, to engage with the public and we want to ensure the public voice is taken into account uh, in how parks are managed, not just Grace Park, but parks across the city. A change of the kind proposed would not be quite as straightforward as it appears. Uh, it would involve individuals be being willing to become individual trustees in their own right and with that, that brings responsibilities and liabilities in there as individual trustees. Uh, there'd also be implications for the council uh, in their, the role as a corporate trusteeship, uh, which would result in all likelihood decisions for the council and the corporate trustee to be delegated to an officer to make those decisions uh, alongside the other trustees in there. And there are practical implications around the support and advice that could be made available to the new trustees by council officers in that respect. But, you know, we are committed to looking at this and we have asked officers to, to investigate what options are available to us and within the committee structure to support local councillors and stakeholders to be more formally involved. This is a city uh, park, as you, as you state, and it's the biggest park in the city. Uh, and as such, you know, it, it's part of the overall corporate responsibility in there. Question six was how does the council square its duty for care and maintain the charitable assets of Grace Park in light of the fact in question two. The answer, we, we have, the council has a duty of care 
uh, for Grace Park in its entirety, including the Rose Garden Cafe building and all the green space within. All the revenue gen budget generated for within Grace Park has been spent within the park. Uh, while some minor repairs and maintenance have taken place at the Rose Garden Cafe building, the, the large majority of expenditure has been on the maintenance and the upkeep and management of the green space within the park. The council makes a considerable grant contribution each year to support the charity. Uh, it's clear from the accounts there is not sufficient funding within the charity, uh, even taking Sheffield City Council's contribution into account to undertake the level of capital expenditure that's required to, on this building. Any decisions in, in terms of large-scale investment in the, form, in the building would have to require additional funding for either from the council or from another source. And that's where we will, we, you know, we do want to work with the groups to investigate what we can achieve in there that, that, that delivers uh, a facility that that's, befits the, that setting in the park. Uh, question seven, you asked which parks in the city are run by trustees or the sole trustee is the council. Uh, the following sites within the city, there's Blackamoor, Charnock Green, Chelsea Park, Earl Marshall Recreation Ground, Encliffe Park, Firth Park, Glen Howe Park, Graves Park, High Hazels Park, Hillsborough Park, Norfolk Park, Fillmore Park, Richmond Park, Richard Rippon Street, Sutherland Road, Western Park and Winkerbank are all uh, are all charity sites where the City Council is the sole trustee. The local community groups and, and relevant groups including friends groups are involved in planning within our park sites and are consulted on activities uh, within the parks. Decisions are then taken in council meetings. Previously it was under the cabinet and the co-op uh, executive meetings, but now the charity subcommittee meetings, as required, will, will make decisions around uh, the, the issues in, in those parts. The response to the earlier question on trust, trustees explains the complexity and the legal complications amending the charity model, but as we said, we've asked officers to look at the options and what, what is available to us there. Uh, that's, I hope that's answered your questions there, Andy. We will get the, the further information that's out to you, it will be in the minutes of this, this meeting as well, uh, so it will be there on the public record for you. Uh, we have a question from Caroline. Caroline there, sorry. Uh, as the Chair of Friends of Grace Park, we have three questions from Caroline, if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, thank you. Um, regarding the public document pack that is provided for this meeting, the report refers to the 2009 scheme regarding Graves Park. Are the trustees aware that this scheme is in addition to the original conveyances of 1925, 1931 and 1936 and does not replace or override them? Question two. Have the trustees replied to the Charity Commission's letter on pages 25 and 26 of the report, and if so, what was their response regarding the charitable land that is currently still waiting to be restored to parkland? The friends assume that this land is the old Norton nursery site, two parts of which are already restored by Friends of Graves Park and open to the public. The friends have been waiting for permission to start the next section for the past seven years. The friends already have a scheme for this work and have already agreed to fund the restoration. Can you give us a time scale of when that permission will be forthcoming? Question three. Since our last correspondence with the Charity Commission, the council has now published a notice that they intend to sell the freehold on Bowl Hill Farm, which was sold in 1982, contrary to the original conveyance of 1925. When did the trustees discuss this sale and when was the decision made to sell this land? Please note that land in the Graves Park Trust has no power of sale 
and is designated charitable land. Was the decision incorrectly delegated to council officers? And if so, when did this happen? Has the council contacted the Charity Commission about this yet to seek advice? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions there. Uh, the, the, I'll, I'll answer them as a, in, in the order you asked them there and, and hopefully further, further responses will come as part of the, the overall committee meeting as we discuss the report with the officers as well. Uh, the the qu first question relating to the 2009 scheme. Uh, the 2009, 2009 scheme specifically states it does replace the, replace the former trust of the charity. Uh, there may be requirements in the original conveyances that still do apply, but not those that are the former trusts of the charity. So there is the overriding charity that in 2009, the document replaced those previous ones. But there are uh, some original conveyances within there that are carried forward into the new document that's there. Uh, have the trustees replied to the Charity Commission's letter? The letter from the Charity Commission forms part of the, the, the report that will be the, discussed at this, this subcommittee this afternoon. Uh, the response to the Charity Commission will be discussed as part of this meeting, therefore no response has been sent yet, but we have spoken to the Charities Commission regarding the letter uh, and received extensions because they knew we, we were discussing it as part of this meeting here. As per the previous correspondence with Parks and Countryside regarding the Norton Nursery area of Grace Park, at the present time it, it's still uh, an operational site within Grace Park that's operating machinery and equipment within the park and the, the wider parks area. So we, we can't at the moment make that commitment and give you a firm date when it's coming back. The council is continuing to look for alternative solutions to all its operational depot facilities and the Norton Nurseries is being considered as part of this review. Uh, the council has given the commitment that when we can progress this issue, we will, but for, just, but for now, we need this area to service Grace Park, but as part of the overall review of the council depots and accommodation, we are looking at this now. Uh, we've not said it's no longer the park, we've not designated it as something else. It, it's still held within the, the, the trust of the park. Uh, the question regarding Bowl Hill Farm. Uh, the council believes that the disposal of the freehold does not require the decision of the relevant committee to answer that question in that there's no decision to be made. This being a disposal of the council, that the disposal of the council must by law complete around the leaseholder reversion that's going in there. The current freehold disposal is a consequence of the decisions made in 1982 and 1994, not of a new decision. Regarding the original decision to sell Bull Hill Farm, a report was submitted to the Recreation Committee on the 3rd of the September 1979, uh, and the minutes of that meeting gave the authority to dispose. The Charity Commission was consulted at that time and confirmed authority to dispose in correspondence dated 4th of, November, 4th of December 1980. Uh, as I say, there may be more things that, that come out as the officers talk through the report in response to the questions, and maybe questions that come from members as well. We have one further question from Ruth Hubbard, uh, that I'll read out the question and the response. Part of the response. Can, can I just ask a question on that? Because um, that's uh, that bit from 1979. We're saying that we can dispose of the freehold of this farm currently because of a report done in 1979 or signed off in 1980. Okay. All right. That's that the, the, the decision was taken then uh, and the Charity Commission were, were consulted on that decision and I, I understand this is part of the leaseholder reversion that the, the freehold, the sale of the freehold in that respect. Okay, I'll, I'll maybe come back and ask some questions about, have some information on that. Yeah, that's quite weird. <laughs> right, and the, the, the final question that we had from, <coughs> excuse me, from Ruth Hubbard. Uh, I'll read it out in full and then and the, the answer, but part of the answer has already been, and part of the, the point she's raised has been raised in the, the previous questions. Uh, as I'm unable to attend, I would be grateful, very grateful, I'm hoping that my question will be read out and answered, and especially as the subcommittee meets infrequently, I shall be watching the webcast. 
Please can I ask you to confirm which parts across the city are run by trustees with the council sole trustee? It includes most or all of our big parks, doesn't, doesn't it? Uh, and we gave that list again, but I'll repeat it in the answer. Giving the huge importance of parks to citizens and community well-being, extremely committed friends groups and other stakeholders who all have expertise and experience, the state of commitment to people first and communities having meaningful influence, Council claims that it is significantly changing the, its work, the way it works, and the errors this Council appears to be making and serious constraints the Council continues to work with. How is it ever possible, justifiable or desirable, that you're making decisions about our parks include, that those making decisions about our parks include only you and exclude all others? You also claim as a Council to have learnt the lessons from the street tree debacle and I'm pretty sure that the independent street tree inquiry will, amongst other things, highlight the serious risks of seeking to exclude and the considerable benefits from, benefits from joint oversight and management of vital community assets. So will you rapidly review and rectify this situation in light of this council's stated policy positions and commitments to ensure that the management and oversight of our parks benefits from much better governance arrangements that fully include the significant, contr significant contributions that a range of appropriate others can bring as trustees or equivalent, depending upon structures adopted. Uh, as listed before, the, the sites that are charity status with the City Council as sole trustee are Blackamoor, Charnock Green, Chelsea Park, Earl Marshall Recreation Ground, Encliffe Park, Firth Park, Glenhow Park, Graves Park, High Hazels Park, Hillsborough Park, Norfolk Park, Fillmore Park, Richmond Park, Ripon Street, Southern Road, Western Park and Winker Bank. Uh, and as explained earlier, the, the issue around the relevant groups, including friends groups being involved in planning of the park sites, consulted, uh, decisions are taken by this charity subcommittee as required, and the response to the other question regarding trustees is fairly complex, and as indicated, we have asked officers to, to investigate this and look at what options are available to us. That, that's the last of the questions from the public in there. So we'll move on to item six, the Rose Garden Cafe building, uh, Grace Park update, and the next steps. Uh, I think, Ruth, are you introducing this, this report? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you all for your time today. I'm here to provide an update on the Rose Garden Cafe building in Graves Park, talk through the next steps, and ask that our recommendations are agreed. Um, You'll all be aware that the Rose Garden Cafe building was closed on the 27th of July 22, um, as set out by, by Andy and, and the number of public up, up in the public gallery, um, following health and safety risks being identified as a result of a structural survey report. The report sets out background to the park, the charitable status of the park, the charitable finances and the building itself. I'm not planning to go through it line by line, but I'll set out the key points here. Um, we're assuming that there will be at least three phases to the decision making required around the closure of and structural issues within the Rose Garden Cafe building. The first phase was the immediate decision regarding any replacement refreshment facility within the park. For this decision, options were collated, costed and assessed and the decision was taken on the, 14th, oh, sorry, on the 10th of August 2022. But it's worth saying that, that that decision might be superseded if the cafe building is able to open up under the propping that's being undertaken at the moment. Um, a secondary phase, interlinked heavily with the third phase, will look at the... Slower, please. I can't understand what you're saying. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Could you speak a little slower? Of course I will. I'm sorry. A bit slower. Sorry. Um, a secondary phase, heavily interlinked with the third phase, will look at the viability of the existing structure, any ongoing safety issues, costs and feasibility of options, and will then make recommendations. This decision will consider refurbishment or demolition or any alternatives to those two. This decision will likely be taken by this committee here. This briefing today is not presenting or reviewing those options. That information is being gathered at the moment and will be presented at the appropriate point. No decisions have been taken on this yet by anybody. The third phase, linked with the second phase, will then look at future options for cafe provision within the park. It will include consultation with the local and city population on potential facilities, funding and opportunities. This will be required whatever the outcome of the second phase of decisions. 
This decision will likely be taken by this charity subcommittee or possibly by the finance subcommittee, depending on whether there's a capital or revenue implication for those decisions. Again, this briefing is not presenting on or reviewing these options. That information is still being gathered and will pre be presented at the appropriate point and no decisions have been taken on this by anyone at this point. Regarding the closure of the building, in addition to the survey that was undertaken in 2018, two further surveys were completed this year that highlighted the poor and deteriorating condition of the building. In the latest um, report, which was undertaken as part of a feasibility study to explore how the building could be improved to support a better cafe offer, concerns were raised about the structural stability of the building and a decision was taken to close the building immediately on health and safety grounds. The building does remain closed today and I'll be set out to you that that's 90 days later. A propping design has been agreed and the contractors started work yesterday to prop the building to allow safe access. The primary purpose of the propping is to allow surveyors safe access to the building to undertake very detailed surveys looking at all elements of the building and any issues with the building structure. We don't yet know whether the cafe operator will be able to operate from the building once the surveys have been completed, but we have agreed with Brew Kitchen and one of the directors at Thornbridge that we will continue to explore this option. After the surveys are complete, a full options appraisal will be undertaken, including gathering detailed costs of what each option might, um, might cost to be able to follow up. We believe that through the full options appraisal, the only reasonable options that will be available to the trustees acting in the charity's best interests are one, do nothing, ensure that members of the public are kept safely away from the building through secure fencing, but make no repairs to the building. Two, structural st stabilization of the existing building and refurbishment of it. Three, demolition of the existing building and provision of a modular facility in its place. Four, demolition of the existing building and provision of a traditional build facility in its place. And then five, demolition of the existing building and site clearance only. The Charity Commission have recently written to the trustees of the Ch Graves Park Charity regarding the trust land and the closure of the cafe building. I did want to highlight at this point that our original reading of the letter assumed it related solely to the Rose Garden Cafe building and the surrounding issues. But when we questioned the reference to, and I'm quoting here, having the land restored back to parkland or to instead build on the land, plus having received the question from Caroline, we do now understand that the letter refers both to the closure of the Rose Garden Cafe building and also part of Graves Park referred to as the Norton Nurseries. The letter asked the trustees' intentions on whether they plan to have the land restored back to parkland or instead build on the land. But as I explained in the response to, um, to Caroline earlier, that we've not said that the land is not part of the park and we haven't designated it as anything other than parkland. The land around Norton Nurseries and around the old glass houses is currently used and is needed to service Graves Park as well as the local area. Um, and this will be reviewed as part of the council's depot review. The report has three re recommendations which we would ask the committee to make decisions on. They are, and they're quite, they're quite legal, so I'm gonna read these out exactly if that's okay. One, that's subject to recommendation two, that the subcommittee acting as trustees agree that at this time the options proposed in this report in relation to the future of the cafe building are the only reasonable options available to the trustees acting in the charity's best interests. Two, that in all the circumstances before any final decision is made by the trustees regarding the future of the cafe building pursuant to clause 10 of the scheme and section 110 of the Charities Act 2011, the Charity Commission is approached for guidance on the options set out in this report. And three, that following receipt of the opinion of the Charity Commission and any clarification required, a further report is brought back to the subcommittee for consideration around the future of the cafe building. Um, and I'd also suggest a further recommendation that isn't contained in the report, and that is that the writing of the um, response to the Charity Commission is delegated to Ajman Ali as Executive Director of Operational Services in consultation with the Chair and Vice Chair of this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just, there was one of the points that I think just needs clarification that, that Andy raised in, in when he was talking about uh, before his questions. Uh, some of the terminology that's used is causing a great deal of uh, upset and, and, and mistrust, I suppose, rising from it there. Things like end of life that's used in the report. Can you just clarify where this is coming from? 
in, uh, in the report. Of course, you're looking at me, but do you mind if I hand over to Tom for this one? <laughs> I think he's best placed to answer. Yeah, that, that's, that's absolutely fine. Thank you, Chair. So, um, uh, I suppose the best way of explaining it is that any surveyor's report is a technical surveyor's report and often written in surveyor's language, um, unfortunately or fortunately, I guess. And when people talk about, you know, I think, I, th I can't remember the exact word in the, in the surveyor's report, so forgive me if I get, you know, the, the exact words wrong. But there is reference in there about the building having reached its, its, its kind of reasonable life or coming to the end of its, of its original design life. That doesn't mean that the council's made a decision or will make a decision on the basis of that report to demolish the building. It just means that actually from a technical perspective, the surveyor's belief is that the building was never constructed when it was put together in 1927 to last the amount of time that it has lasted so far. Well, you know, let's, let's be clear. There are lots and lots of buildings around Sheffield that were built in 1927 that were never constructed to last 95 years. So that doesn't mean that we will just, you know, that we will make a decision to just to demolish them. So I understand that the language might cause some concern, but it's very much a technical surveyor's assessment of the building and a way a surveyor will describe the building. Thank you. I hope that clarifies for, for members of the public that it, it, it is the, the technical terminology that's used in there, but doesn't uh, sort of indicate that a decision's been made about things there. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll open this up to questions now. So, uh, Councillor Rooney. Uh, one or two sort of points of clarification more than anything. And um, I, I'm still not entirely sure what the problem, and I think you've said that in, in, your, um, in your contribution, that what the, why the thing is falling down. You said basically it wasn't meant to last 100 years or whatever, but I'm still not entirely sure um, what, why it's in a position, well, we were in a position where we may, may have to knock it down. Um, the other is, I mean, it does sound a, a little dramatic to give people such short notice to, to, to leave the building. Um, and, and, and if that is correct, and I'm not doubting anybody's word, that could have been held, done better, surely, on a, on a phased, uh, a, pr a phase program or some sort of notice, but you know, asking people to leave in 15 minutes is just really not not on, is it? To be honest. So I think maybe an apology for that might, if there hasn't been one, I think maybe an apology for that might be um, forthcoming. Um, the 10,000 people or so that have signed the petition, again, I'm not entirely clear whether they're signing it because. But for, for a love of the building or whether it's about wanting some sort of facility in the park where they can go and get some refreshment uh, and socialise with friends and family and such like. So uh, if you could just um, answer those for the time being. And I do, I, I do believe that we, we saw Covenant Cottage, didn't we, some time ago. And I was just wondering if any thought by local representatives have been given to investing some of the money from that sale into uh, the cafe. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll hopefully try and address those questions if I can. Um, uh, so what was the problem with the building? Um, so it, the original survey set out that it was, it was possibly unsafe. Um, with regard to the specific problems of the building, to be honest, that's why we want to go in and do further surveys to understand everything that, that is the matter with the building. Um, th there are some complex things that, that Tom can talk through, but it is worth saying that we are doing, we're wanting to do extensive surveys so we can understand everything about it. Do you want to come in? Yeah, I can do it. So, so <laughs> no, no, well, and, and, I, and I'm not, let me be really clear. I, I might, I might, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not a surveyor. Okay, let me be really clear about that. So, um, you know, and, 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 I'm, and I'm going on the basis of the information that's in the surveyor's report and the information I've got about what, when, what decisions were taken when. Um, so, there's, there's two surveyor's reports. We've talked a lot about these. There's one from 2018 and there's one most recently from 2022. The 2018 report said that the roof was in a bad state of repair and probably needed replacing. That's what it said. It never said the building was unsafe. It never really gave us any assessment of, you know, anything technical because it was very much a condi what we call a condition survey. It wasn't a structural survey at all. Um, you know, for whatever reason, 
no action was taken on the basis of that 2018 condition report. That was the reason. Was well, I don't, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I genuinely would look through this and I can't, I can't get to the bottom of the reason for that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really difficult to get to underneath that. The reality is, is that, um, you know, we didn't do that. And, and I acknowledge that, and we've acknowledged it in the answer to the question, but we didn't take the action on that basis. We fast forward four years, and the survey is undertaken to look at what we do with the building next, what, you know, in terms of investment, in terms of making it better. And that survey flags again that there are problems with the building, with the roof, and with some with things structurally that go, and the bits structurally go beyond what the 2018 report said in terms of safety. There was a gap between us receiving that report and the actual building having to be closed. And the reason for that was that basically a meeting was arranged on site to discuss what was on the, in that report with the surveyor and council officers. And, and when everybody got onto the site, the structural engineer basically said, now I'm here, we need to do something about this building, we need to close it, it's not safe. Um, the, we had a conversation also with our insurance provider, and our insurance provider was really clear that on the basis of what the surveyor had said to us on the day, not written down, had said to us on the day in terms of the advice around the safety of the building, that our public liability insurance may long, no longer be valid for the building. So on that basis, we had to close it. It's really, you know, genuinely, and we are genuinely sorry that we had to close it at such short notice, but I think, I hope that people can genuinely appreciate that when my officers are put in a position of being told this building is not safe and you've potentially got no public liability insurance, it's, it's not that knee-jerk reaction you know, for people to say we have to close it because it's unsafe. You can't phase that. You can't, you, know, you can't decide to give people lots of notice because the reality is we've been told the building is unsafe and we have to act accordingly. So that's how that, that process worked in terms of that that. that, that, that you know, that how that decision was actually made on, on the day. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that helps in terms of clarity. Chair, can you just clarify next question, point of information? Sorry. We yeah. asked a question about the petition, uh, and I think that's direct, direct, directed at us. And, uh, no, it, it's... <laughs> well, the it's, council haven't raised the petition, Mick. The community no, it's, has. It's, it's, He's asking, the, he's asking the question of the officers around the petition. Thanks, Andy. If I can, Chair, I'm not trying to be awkward, but uh, if Ruth gives me an answer that you think is uh, not correct, then email me the answer that you think is correct, okay? That's a, a way of stopping uh, a, an argument across the floor, and it also gives you the chance to express your views. I'm trying to be helpful, mate. All right. Um, if you don't mind me coming in further just to, to add to Tom's point, um, it, with regard to the, the um, dramatic way that Brew Kitchen were asked to leave the building, um, it's absolutely right, they weren't given very much notice. Um, to go back to what Tom said, we closed the building because we were told that we weren't sure it was safe. Um, we, we made the decision, not, we didn't take that decision lightly, um, we felt we had no choice, we, we, we wanted to keep people safe. Um, we have apologised to Julie, and I know that Julie will have passed the, the apology on to, to her colleagues in Brew Kitchen. I'm happy to reiterate it here. We're really sorry that this building had to close, and we're really sorry it was done so quickly, uh, with so little notice to, to those people that were working in the cafe. Do you want to come in? Or do you want me to come uh, yeah, to I, yeah, I, I, that's, I think now that it's on public record, is 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 a better... It's better than having it as a sort of conversation to one side. It doesn't make the situation any easier for the people that had to run out the building and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But now at least in public there's been an explanation of it and, and I understand that. And as I say, unfortunately, it doesn't make the situation any easier for the staff or the, or, or the people running the business there. No, you're absolutely right, it, it doesn't. Um, with regard to your third question around, around the petition, um, I, I think, and I, and I do appreciate that Andy might not agree with me, that, that, that I'm not sure that we know whether everybody that signed that petition loves the building 
or whether it's a love of the building, but actually that a cafe facility is very important to them. Um, I, I'll say two things. So first of all, it, that's why we want to do further consultation to understand what is important to people within that park and also what is important about that building um, to, to those people who visit the park day in, day out. Um, uh, and also, I just want to reiterate the council's commitment to having a cafe in the park. We have said it's important to us. Um, we, we're not looking to, to, to make decisions about this building that don't involve a cafe in the future. We just don't yet know what form that cafe might take. Um, and, and then on, on the question for, I'm ever so sorry, I can't answer that question with regard to Codner Cottage. I, I, I know the sale was a number of years ago. I don't know what's happened to those monies. We can find out and come back to you if that's helpful. I think just, just for clarity and, and not opening it up, but Andy, if, I don't know who's presenting the position at council next week, whether it's yourself or Liz, but maybe that's a, a point you can clarify within that presentation to full council that explains, you know, the, the, your understanding of what the, the petition is written to. That may help colleagues within the wider debate in the, in the council chamber next week. Douglas, Councillor Johnson. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Councillor. Uh, I've got a few questions, just picking up on some of the issues there. Um, I'm just thinking how to go through this. I mean, first of all, I agree with Councillor Rooney. I mean, I think it is important that, I think you described it as dramatic the way it was suddenly closed and the idea about security people being sent in. Not sure exactly how that happened. I mean, I have to say, I've read the survey, the structural reports, um, they don't seem to me to lead to necessarily to that level of uh, what looks like panic. Um, but we are where we are. Um, and, you know, I think that what you said about you know, apologising to people is, you know, is well worth noting. It might be worth pointing to recommendations. We're just thinking about where we are. But there, there is, I think, a couple of important questions. It's partly why people have got so wound up about this. It hasn't made the council look good, but there are some key questions that we do need an answer. Um, where we have them, and appreciate may not have an answer. One of those questions is, you know, why was there no action taken on the um, report in 2018, which identified the building as bad and failing? And I think we've actually got the answer now. Um, that we simply don't know, that there appears to be no record there. And if that is the case, then I think we have to accept we don't have an answer to that question. But, but the other question, more fundamentally, is really about how the council got put in this position in the first place. And what I still don't understand is why we, um, what was a perfectly good council facility in the first place back in 2008, why we outsourced it on a long-term business lease um, you know, Madden Building Permit 1954, commercial business lease where the repairing responsibilities normally go to the occupier on a lease of that length. And I, and I still would like to know what was the reason for opting out of that and, and retaining the repairing obligations for the council when we clearly didn't have any resources to do that level of maintenance in the same way we haven't done it in any of our other parks. Um, uh, and the, I might be fogging a dead horse here about saying, can we go back to the records and find out what was decided about that? But if we can, I think it will be very useful to put a finger on that and say, yeah, this was done for this reason at this time, and either it looked like a good decision or we acknowledge it was a bad decision. But that's fundamentally what set us up here. We've put ourselves in a position where we, we can't properly comply with um, the need to maintain the building in the way it needs to be. I wonder if you can take that away, Ruth, and see if you can come back. If it's possible to get that information, come back to um, all of us and campaigners before next week, it might just help frame that um, debate, knowing that we're going to have to deal with this all over again next week in full council, and, and quite rightly so, um, because it is something where people want answers. Um, so thanks for that. Um, sorry, Councillor, uh, can, yes. can I just clarify something there? You made reference to the... Was there a the lease granted in 2020 to expire in 2021. I'm just looking at the report 1.1. 1 .1. 2009. So two, two, 2009 to 2019 was a 10 year lease. And then after 2019, it was renewed, I think, for two years. I mean, it's now a tenancy at will. So it's changed. And what I wanted to know is what was the series of legal transactions that were carried out then, which I was hoping would be in this report, to be honest. Um, but I think we. We ought to understand that because we ought to understand what was the long-term thinking. And I've sort of been partly put onto that by the fact that we've obviously got records of, um, of land transactions going back to 1979 on this one. 
Um, so we ought to have those records there and just find out who decided what at that time, partly so that we can learn from that and, and think about how we deal with this. But, and I say that because actually um, we're facing up to massive budget issues. We've got lots of properties in lots of parks involving lots of charitable trusts, which we're the trustee of. Um, we need to get a grip of this so we don't set ourselves up in the future on this again. The second, can I ask a second question on that, and then I'll perhaps pause and let other people have a go. Just, can I, whilst we're on that topic, can I just deal with the issue of Bowl Hill Farm? Um, this is new to me, I wasn't aware of this. W when did we put a notice saying we were putting that up for sale? Um, to be clear, it's not, it's not the farm that's currently up for sale. The, the farm was sold in 19, I think it's 1981 or 1980. This is the freehold, um, and we put the notice up, I believe it was, I think like, two or three weeks ago now. Right, thanks. I appreciate it. He's, he's the freehold, so selling freeholds is a bit of a technical exercise. That said, given the sensitivity of this, it would kind of make us look stupid to rush into digging ourselves a big hole now. If we're saying that we're selling something that is a freehold of something associated with Grace Park, which is a separate charity, there's quite a lot of public interest in this. We say we're doing it because we agreed to do it back in December 1980. I think it will be helpful to have that run past this committee as charity trustee, to be honest. Um, we may not want to deal with it, but frankly, if we don't deal with it now, then I think we may have difficulty. Uh, we don't need to do it right now. It may be helpful to send around a written briefing to us five to tell us what's going on on that, and then perhaps we can make a decision whether we need to deal with it as a committee with legal advice. I think on that one, Sarah wants to comment. Yeah, I appreciate that Councillor Johnson said we didn't need to go through it now, but I think probably it would be helpful to clarify for the committee. So um, the phrase sale has been used, and I think I need to clarify. Uh, what was granted in the 80s was a long leasehold interest. So um, obviously when you're buying a residential property, people talk about buying a leasehold. Um, but it's a long, it, it, we weren't selling the whole property. It was a, a long leasehold interest. Um, as you may be aware, when people have a long leasehold interest, there is an entitlement to um, a, what is known as a freehold <laughs> leasehold enfranchisement. So you can exercise your right to buy the freehold. That's an operation of law. So having, it's, it's not that we made a decision in the 1980s to sell the freehold. There was a decision in the 1980s to grant a long leasehold. The leaseholder is now exercising their legal right to buy the freehold and that is not something the council can stop or object to. So there is no decision to make. It is an operation of law and that's why that's just been implemented as a operation of law and hasn't been brought to this committee. So there is no decision to make, it's an operation of law. Sorry, can I, to, I appreciate that, you know, the, we've had the officer response there. Uh, if that's not the case, then, you know, we can have a look through and go through, but that's the officer response on the information that, that we're given at the time. Yeah, sorry, if I, I can go back. Uh, that's, that's helpful to know, uh, Sarah. Um, because if it is operational law, it's, so it's a bit like right to buy, it's, it's right to first refusal, it's a statutory requirement. All the same, if we could have a note of that, um, just give us the, that in black and white, and possibly with reference to the original decision in 1980, so we know what that is. I completely appreciate there's perhaps no decision for us to be making there, but perhaps we should all be satisfied with that in writing, just so we can nail that down, really. Um, so, Chair, I've got a couple more questions, but I don't know if I want to let other people jump in. Do you, do you want to answer those the questions that were put there? I think Tom was in the question. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll just make a start, because actually, Councillor Johnson, really, really, um, there's an important point I probably should have made around the decision to close and some of the actions that we took following the closure, that um, in order to, you know, clearly, we, we we closed the building in a really short time because you know we were given really clear concerns in terms of the structure of that building and following that closure you know like everybody else we were keen to make absolutely certain there was no way we could just allow it to reopen you know if, if, if we had got it wrong if it had been a knee-jerk reaction based on an assessment of risk by an officer clearly what we wanted to make sure is that you know we had that backed up by an amount of information to support that short-term decision. If we'd got that short decision wrong, we would have allowed it to reopen again. 
So we basically, that on the basis of that first meeting, we got a written report of that first meeting from the surveyor. And then following that, we also commissioned an independent structural surveyor from outside of the council, completely independent company who came in and also uh, you know, provided us with a written report that also backed up the decision that we made in the short term in terms of the structural safety of that building. So, you know, it wasn't just that we made the decision and then did nothing in terms of it. We made the decision and made sure we backed that up with independent evidence to show that it had to remain closed because it wasn't safe. So I just thought it would be useful to clarify that. And, and thanks, Councillor Johnson, for giving me the opportunity to clarify that. Ruth, I don't know whether you want to... Um, I, I think we need to come back to you in writing regarding some of these questions that, you, that you've asked, if that's okay. Yeah, thanks. That's that's appreciated. And, and Tom, thanks for that clarification because it is just important. You know, I, mean, I, I know the officer's been doing a lot of work on this, and as I said before, we are where we are. So, so that's it. Can I ask a question on a slightly different tack about finances? Um, I mean, we, we know that the charity doesn't come anywhere near raising its own money to keep itself going. What is the shortfall that the council has to make up each year? Do, do you have those figures? It varies slightly from year to year. My recollection is that the last figure was around about, I think it was, I feel like it was 200, 270,000. It was about 60% of the funding to, to, to maintain and manage the park, including the animal farm. 272. So, sorry, 272, right, okay. So, this, for so many others, the charity raises 40% of its own money but 60% is provided by the council out of council's funds. Okay. I mean, it's really my next question. Um, obviously, Campaign Group naturally wants to see, you know, a good investment in the park with additional funds. Um, the my understanding is that would have to be taken from resources for other parks across the city, um, if perhaps in, you know, for deprived areas. And that's a real problem for us. Um, what, what is the, what are the options for transferring money across the city to what these proposals is there a plan there at present i think this links to one of the answers that was given to andy that we simply don't don't know enough yet so we don't have those options what we need to do is gather the information understand more about the, the costs and then work out what the options are to fund those options okay thanks that's a work in progress and can you just tell us anything more about the consultation that's planned because it seems to me that a sensible way forward to look at the whole future of the building you know, with all the options on the table, is to consult with users of that. What, when we, when's that plan for what's going to cover? I don't have specific answers to either of those things. What I can tell you is that in the, the last meeting that we had with the, the Friends of Graves Park and also the Save the Rose Garden Cafe campaign, that, that we explained to them our desire to do further consultation and we agreed that we would work with them on what those questions would look like so that we can we can all be happy that we're asking the right questions of all the people that, that use and love the park. Okay, so that's another work in program. I'm just asking because I know that you know, the campaigners, you know, are a bit frustrated about consultation and we're going to keep the wrong grass. But if the other option is simply putting in an injection of funds, but if that's not an option because there simply aren't those funds waiting to go about, what's the second best option? And it just seems to me that, you know, we've got a really engaged community there and it's got to be right for consultation if it's, if it's done right to work out, you know, what do we do with this building? Okay, thanks very much. Um, Can I just... Just where the, the written answers that you have sent to, to Councillor Johnson, can you make sure they come to all of us and also to, to Craig so they're included within the minutes and um, we're getting included within the minutes of this committee so it's on the public record that's there. Uh, and just regarding the consultation, is that going to be through the local area committee that will be conducting them because, the, you know, is that or is it across the wider city that we need to understand because this is a city, a city facility. Uh, so I'm just looking at uh, Richard as, as the chair of the, the, the committee that has the parks under it, and whether it, we're looking it's across the whole city, it's not just it, within that, that area, I think is what we you know, want to make sure it's, it's, it's wider. Um, I think crudely we, we would want to approach it in the same way that, for example, we approach um, consultation around Hillsborough Park. Like when we talk about tram lines, we don't exclusively talk about that local community because it is a park that's, that's visited by people from across the city. We'd want to do the same. Um, the, the, um, the campaign group and the Friends of Graves Park have said, for example, if the cafe is able to get back in and operate, they would anticipate potentially having a desk in the cafe where they can ask people coming in. So I think we would be wanting to go everywhere and talk to everyone. 
Yeah, Councillor Johnson, you have more questions. I've really got just two more things I wanted to ask. Um, left now. Um, and it's just about um, what this committee does and what the Parks Committee does, because the different bodies do different things here. Um, so first of all, there's an additional recommendation. To, so it's about dealing with the fact that, as, as tr the trustee, we've got this letter from the Charity Commission. We need to respond to it. Um, it doesn't look like a ter terribly difficult letter, but it needs to be done properly, and the proposal will do that. Uh, I think the proposal is that um, it's signed off by the executive director with consultation, and really just like to be included in that. So there's comment from all three party groups. Um, so maybe we can add that to the recommendation if that's um, acceptable. Yeah, for we, the rest we, of the we've committee. agreed that with myself, yeah. the deputy chair, and yeah. Councillor Johnson's <coughs> representative of the group. But thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, and then secondly, it's just separating out what does this committee have to do, what is it able to do, and what's really within the remit of the um, Parts Committee, chaired by Councillor Williams, because it seems that ultimately this is really all a big operational mm -hmm. issue. It, it, it's a fairly routine job, small job about maintenance in a park. It's not a small job at all, but it, is really, it seems to be properly in the remit of the, of the Parks Committee and, and the fact that I referred already to the amount of work that Office has been doing on this. Um, is there anything more that this committee will need to do, uh, apart from dealing with this um, this letter to the Charity Commission? I'm, I'm quite kind of questioning that because there's a proposal in here that we go and ask the Charity Commission for advice. Um, and, and personally, I've, I've indicated I'm not entirely sure that they're going to be willing to give advice on how to run a um, how to run a park properly. Because actually, this is a, a proper job of the local authority. It, it, you know, from, apart from this issue. It runs Gray's Park well. It's a big park. It's well used. There's a lot of resource that goes into it. The Charity Commission is surely not going to get involved with that. I'm going to try and cover all of that if I possibly can. Please shout out if I miss anything. Um, what will be the job of this committee with um, Grace Park being a charitable site? We would anticipate decisions about that, that park coming here, all of them. Um, the, the Communities, Parks and Leisure Committee, they, they do have some involvement, obviously, with, with Grace Park and all of our sites, including all those charitable sites, because they will make decisions regarding the budget. Um, were there to be decisions about Graves Park, about this building, about anything to do with, with specific monies in this park, at, at best we would probably take a paper to the Communities, Parks and Leisure um, committee for information because they wouldn't be able to make decisions necessarily. Any decision that requires the charity trustees to make a decision, they would have to. It would have to come here. Um, we, it, it wouldn't be made by the um, Council Williams Committee. Right, I, I, I'll maybe come back to it. Sorry, Tom, do you want to come? I was, I was just going to add on, it's, it's important to also recognise that if the council was to decide, and this is obviously, there's a lot of what's in the, it, you know, ifs in this, there's lots of ifs and buffs, but still, because we need to do the detailed work. But if the council was decide, to decide that it wanted to uh, provide a grant to the to to uh, to the charity mm -hmm. to undertake work on the building, that decision potentially will have to come through finance subcommittee because it will be about a capital program, about an allocation of expenditure. Mm -hmm. So it's actually quite, you know, as you probably outlined in your question, Councillor Johnson, this is actually quite a complicated governance landscape that we're dealing with here. And a, and a complicated series of decisions depending on what it is that we ultimately propose and recommend. Yeah. Well, I just want to round off on that just because this committee doesn't have a, an operational budget, whereas Parks Committee does. Important point. Um, and then if I can just come in with one last point, sorry. Um, and, and that is just to say that we, we, we think it we should write to the Charities Committee, the, sorry, the Charity Commission, because we think they may give us advice about whether or not those options are um, are the only options available to us. We, we think that they might, and I, and I guess there's a point that at worst they might say no, but at best they might give us advice. Thank, and, and I think we have sought Charity Commission opinions on, on things previously, haven't we? On this. Thank you. Councillor Williams. I forgot what I was going to ask. <laughs> um, well, firstly, what I was going to ask was actually being clarified. It was about the process of um, the report, the further report, so I don't need to go through that again. Um, the other point I just want to make, as it currently stands and is currently my understanding, communities, parks and leisures does not have responsibility for the maintenance of the buildings in the parks. We have, um, and so, yeah. that's, that's just the way it is, Douglas. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Where is it? 
I believe it's, it's with the... You want me to set it out a little bit yes. um, for the public record? Thank you. Uh, yes, there is an oddity. Um, so, um, in, in, in really easy terms, Parks and Countryside is responsible for the, for the maintenance and management of the green space, and um, um, facilities um, management is responsible for the maintenance of buildings, so there is an odd so separation, which does mean that the income from the cafe was coming to Parks and Countryside, it wasn't going to the service that is responsible for the maintenance of that building. Okay. Uh, Councillor Grocon. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got quite a list of questions. You'll have to bear with me because some of them have been answered as, as we've gone along. And some of them are just a little bit more clarification and a better understanding. But I think I'd like to start with the first point in relation to um, the preamble that Andy gave to his question in relation to um, how unuser friendly our system is at the moment. Because I think, you know, starting point, um, that is really important. Um, we have moved to a new committee style of governance. Um, we are all trying to get our heads around it. I actually chair the committee that looks into that and we are having a review. And I think it's, it's really important that we listen to and take notice of things like that. Because if we're gonna get things on an even keel moving forward, we need, you know, it's really important that as members of the public, if you are wanting to engage with us, it's as straightforward and easy as it can possibly be. And, and clearly what you're saying is it's not. So I need to take that up with the committee. So thank you for, for that, which I get is a completely separate point, but it's relevant to you and how we are interacting in relation to, you know, this particular issue. I think the next thing it's probably important for me to say is, um, I lived all the time my children were growing up at that end of town and I have lots of very happy memories of spending an awful long time in that park and in that cafe with my children through all their childhood. So it, it's very important to me, even though I probably now live as far away in Sheffield from that park as you possibly could, um, I have lots of um, very happy and very um, wonderful memories there, not least that there used to be a, um, a pig in the park in the farm called Julie, which was gave hours and hours of entertainment to my children growing up um, because I was also a police officer. There you go. Oh, um, <coughs> even better. So there you go. Um, down, down to the important stuff now. Um, listening to, to Julie, the manager, talking about your experience, you know, Hopefully, you are satisfied by the responses you've had today. I, I can't begin to imagine how distressing that was for you and your staff. That's, you know, that's not acceptable. I think we, we've, we've heard from officers, they were in a very difficult position. And, you know, if, if we can learn lessons from that moving forward, I think it's really important that we do learn lessons from that. A couple of things for me on the back of that. Um, we know that there was a ten tendency at will operating with the operators. So I would just like some clarity that because that was the way that we were operating, did that in any way that, you know, there is no notice period to be given. It's just some, some clarity around, did that in any way play any part in the decision to close immediately? I think it would just be really helpful for us to understand whether that is or isn't um, the case, number one. Moving on then to the condition of the building, there's a number of comments um, in, in, the re in the officer's report about, you know, the structure when we've discovered what, what happened when with the building and, and, and other colleagues have picked up on questions about that. But what I would like to understand is, um, if as a customer I was walking into the building, if, you know, as a local councillor I was going into the building, if as one of the staff who worked there going into the building, would those defects be obvious for me to see for somebody to have been flagging them up before we got to this situation of a, um, a survey that, that needed doing or not? Because I think it's important that, you know, we, un we understand that. And because I know it says that the timber frame structure from the Rose Garden Cafe being subject to significant distortion. Of course, the first thing I think about is the spire at Chesterfield Church, you know, and that's there for all the world to see. So are we talking about something that had been seen for a long time and why had nobody picked it up? 
or has this genuinely come about because we've done the inspections and then it's it's been picked up as a result of that and, and so we couldn't have foreseen other than doing the inspections that we were going to be in this state of um, decay and disrepair um, that we were in. I think it's really important that we can we can get to understanding that. I think picking up on the points that Councillor Johnson made about funding, you know, we have got lots of parks um, across the city. I think you might have got one missing off the list because I'm sure one of mine is, but I'll take that up with you afterwards, Ruth. Um, and, and so for me, it's about, you know, there's, there's been a lot of investment into this park. We all understand, you know, the terrible situation with council's finances over the last 10 years um, because of austerity. Um, are we confident that we are dealing fairly inequitably with all of the parks financially across the city? And how do we make sure that that happens? Because I think, you know, we need to make sure that we're investing in all of our parks. I think if COVID has taught us anything, it's the great value and benefit that they bring on so many levels. So it's about, I think, also having an understanding, and this may be something that, you know, Councillor Williams wants to pick up in his, um, with his committee, about how we're making sure that the investment is equitable um, across the city. And then one of the other, I think, that would be helpful to understand is we've got a long-standing friends group and I, I don't know when, when you were formed, but I understand you've been going for quite some time. So it's about, um, historically, how often has the Friends Group been meeting with officers and with local councillors, and what sort of things were in those discussions when they were having them? And is this something that, I mean, it, 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 it's irrelevant depending on really the first point, but, it, you know, is this something that's been raised when local councillors have been talking to the Friends Group or... The friends group have been talking to officers, whatever. How, you know, what sort of things have the, those discussions um, been around? And I think, for, for me personally, just thinking about my own parks, it's it's probably something when, you know, when I'm going to my regular meetings with my friends groups, you know, it, is this something that just out of good practice needs to be picking up and talking about conditions of buildings and, and, and those sorts of things? So I think trying from here on in to, to learn lessons as you know, not just waiting for structural reports, how often they're done, but as local councillors being um, proactive and, and understanding how proactive, you know, we've been as local councillors with this particular park. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll try and go through the questions one at a time and hand over to Tom as did, if that's okay. Um, on, on the first question, did the fact that the, the operator was operating under a tenancy at will have any part to play in the decision to close the building. No, the building was closed due to health and safety issues. Um, the the um, contract that they had with us wasn't a part of that. We needed to close it because we were told it may not be safe. Um, for, for the second question, if I can hand over to Tom, if that's okay. Just just on the first question, as far as, I, I, as, far as I'm aware, the officers, the facilities management officers who made the decision to close the building have no knowledge yeah. of what the nature of the tenancy was at the point when they made that decision. So it absolutely no influence whatsoever. Um, uh, and we would have had to suffer the consequences if the tenancy had been something different, clearly, um, as a council. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the, the things that were raised by the structural engineer are not necessarily things that you would just walk into the building and say, ah, oh, right, oh, this building's got a big problem. The reality is, is that where any issues were reported about the building, so, you know, the roof's leaking or we've got an issue with X, Y, and Z, the door won't close properly or whatever, facilities management went out and undertook those minor repairs and we've got records of some minor repairs over the last four or five years to that building but no one throughout that period has ever gone in and said you know oh my god this thing looks awful there's a you know whatever it's falling down so you know uh, there's nothing on record that I've seen that would say anybody has previously said over between 2018 and 2022 that there's a, you know, that they're concerned about that building or they've spotted something associated with that building until the structural engineer's gone in there and with a professional set of eyes said, you know, that doesn't look right. So I think that, that you know, hopefully we're reassured that, you know, nobody's raised anything with us that we've not then followed up. Thank you. Uh, yeah, on, on to question three, I don't really know how you, how you want to deal with this. So are we confident that we're dealing fairly and equitably with to all our parks and investment in those parks. Um, I, I'd like to say yes. I don't know whether perhaps the, the answer here is to bring a report to the committee's parks and leisure 
um, setting out what investment there is in what parks and how, how that looks and what our future plans are, if, if that's an okay way of dealing with that. Um, and then question four around the friends of groups and other local stakeholders, um, how often do we meet them and, and what's been discussed? Um, we, we do talk to the friends of group a lot um, about various issues. I'm not aware that there's been anything particularly about the structure of the building, although the friends of are very interested in the building and have put forward ideas. Um, what I'm happy to do if, if, if it answers your question and also is something that the friends of group are interested by a Caroline, it is I can, I can commit to looking at whether or not we're engaging with them in the best way. Do we need more regular meetings where we pick up those kind of things? And obviously that wouldn't be exclusive to, to Graves Park because we do have other parts with other buildings. So we, we can look at whether or not we're talking to everybody we need to be talking to in the best way about all of the things that we should be talking about. Okay. Yeah. I suppose just a comment there. It, it, when I go in, I use Grace Park and go in and, um, and walk around, and I suppose I look at the building and think, it's an old building and you, you sort of expect it to look old, don't you? And so I suppose as a, as a lay person, you just see it and think, it's just an old building that... That's what happens to them. Uh, Councillor Rooney. Yeah, uh, two or three comments more than anything. Um, as someone who represents the southeast, part of the southeast of the city, uh, we'd like a park, please, because we don't actually have one. Um, so I just thought I'd get that one in. Um, the other is I have, I mean, I share, share the same very, very pleasant memories of, of Grace Park. I used to take my children there, and I can still see. Um, see them sliding down uh, the uh, bouncy castles of former councillor Bob Pullin. So I'm giving. I'm just. I'm just taking the opportunity. That's where I start, first started my friendship with him, and uh, he's not having a very good time at things at the moment. So I wish him well. But the main point that I really wanted to make was, um, I think, given the sensitive nature of the, 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 the possible consequences to this building. I think it, it's a belt and braces approach to talk to the Cat Charity Commission, even if the answer it comes back it says, no, thank you, it's up to you to sort it out. At least we've, we've asked. And I think that is the sensible approach. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Just an observation, really. As I understand it, the local ward councillors have been are in regular contact with friends of group and they have a good good relationship. Thank you. Any other further questions or comments? Councillor Johnson. So, so just think about um, dealing with the recommendations there. I think we're moving towards recommendation from this committee about dealing with the letter of the Charity Commission. And I should clearly take Councillor Rooney's point, it probably makes sense. There's no harm in putting that request for assistance. Maybe it could be done in the same letter, and we could authorise that to be done. What I've just got some concern about is about being asked to agree that the five options in the report are the only reasonable options. Um, I mean, my, my gut feeling is I'm not satisfied that they are, because, uh, and also not satisfied that we, we need to make a decision on that at the moment. Um, it seems to be an operational issue, but as the consultation hasn't even started yet, I don't know and I can't say what that will throw up yet. Do we actually need to make a decision on that? Because I'd not really be very keen on supporting that. Can I just, um, we're not being asked to make a decision on that. That's just laying out what the options and then going to the Charity Commission and asking their opinion. Is that right? The, the first recommendation um, do, does say that you to ask you to agree that they are uh, they are the only options, uh, the re only reasonable options available to you. If, if it's preferred, we could say that the only reasonable options available to you include, because um, one of the things there is, is uh, do the Charity Commission want to exclude any of those options at this stage? Councillor Rooney. How about adding at this time? Okay. Would that, would that make you happy? Yeah. I'm, I'm just confused what, what the other, other options are there, because it talks about do nothing. Stabilise the existing building, refurbish, demolish it, demolish and provide traditional build, or just clear the site. I'm, I'm not quite sure what other options there are. Well, to be fair, I think uh, Ruth's laid out the, those options there. I'm just saying there might be other options that come out of consultation. That's what you do about consultation. But actually, now I see the point that this was in here. 
it, it reads as though we're being asked to exclude any other options that don't fall into one of those five pockets there, which I don't think is the intention. Um, I think the, uh, the question here is whether, whether we get advice from the Charity Commission that any of those options they would want to rule out. So I think what you're saying really is that when we ask the Charity Commission for advice, um, the, we specifically want advice on whether they consider that any of those options would be in breach of the charitable scheme. If so, then maybe we could reword this completely and include that in the advice um, that's sought from the Charity Commission. Or actually, maybe we don't need to resolve any formal words of this committee because actually the whole text of the letter will be wrapped up um, and signed off by the Executive Director. So perhaps that would be a way forward, rather than getting ourselves tied up in knots on this one. Because I agree with you. Councillor Williams and Councillor Grocco. Yeah, just if you look at recommendation one, it does actually say, agree that at this time. So that does actually mean at this time, leaves it open to other options. Hmm. Councillor Grocco. I think we do need to say something so that people can see that we are considering something. I, I, I don't know, if, if I were the people who come along today and we were saying, well, it's, you know, how much further forward are we? I think it, 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 it allows the friends group and others to go away and start thinking about what are their favoured options. I know we talked about if they're coming back to full council next week then it may be that it will be helpful to them to be able to give us a steer. But I think we still have to come back to Councillor Rooney's point about, um, you know, where do the Charity Commission sit on this? And, you know, what what guidance, if any, do they, do they want to give us? So I think, you know, I think at this time, these are the options that are proposed, because I don't, I, I doubt there's anybody in this room who could probably come up with another option at this time that isn't there. So I think it's it's fair enough. It just, well, they may well do, but but I think I think we covered off because it says at this time, and if next week when we're at full council, if the friends group want to come back and say, actually, you know, we've 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 done some consultation, we've had some, con you know, and and what we'd really like is the council to do X, which isn't one of your options. Our hands aren't tied. We can say, well, yeah, that's fine. That is something that we can look at. But at least it, it, it gives people an understanding of the art of the possible instead of it just being, you know, well, what sort of things are you looking at? Okay, I'll just clarify. When I, when I said we're not, asked to make a decision, we're not asked to make a decision on the specifics on there, and I think the, the, the reassurance from members of the public was, was that we're not just looking and there's no, there's no uh, intention at the moment to demolish the building. And I think that reassurance is what the members of the public are after, that it, it is with included within there, but we need to look at and understand the, the, the outcome of the study into these, these options in there. Councillor Rooney. Well, uh, can I ask Sarah if, if she thinks that the wording that we've got now is Mark Webster's um, unfettered. Are we unfettered? We haven't fettered ourselves. If that is a, if that is a thing. Um, so, are you are you happy that that doesn't restrict us from potentially um, in the future considering whatever option it might be? Yes, Jess. <laughs> unfettered. There you go. <laughs> unfettered is. Autocorrect may not come up with that, but <laughs> okay. Any any other further comments? No. Okay, we we are asked to uh, the the recommendations as laid out there with the additional recommendation about the report. Uh, just before we move, we, we move that recommendation, I just I think it, it's right for the committee. We've all said it and expressed our our. Uh, our, our concerns about for the employees, and I think formally as a committee that, that, that we record that in there as well about these people that have lost their jobs in the current situation and that we are looking to try and resolve this as a matter of urgency. I understand conversations going on with Brew Kitchen about whether they will be able to operate the facility as a, as a takeaway if necessary or things. So I think as the propping's completed and they can get into there and 
we will need a further meeting of the committee to come back to we consider the 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 letter from the, the response from the charities commission and also to look at making further further decisions around it councillor johnson okay just a brief request in terms of the staff there's a julie of the 12 staff who um, seem to have lost their jobs if we're having a discussion with the brew kitchen and i know it's one of the sort of one of the companies in the massive Thornbridge Empire, but can we just have some reassurance that all the people here have actually had their employment rights honoured? You can't normally just sack staff unless they've been employed for a short time. It would be useful for us to have some assurance that people are being treated fairly in their employment rights. I, I, understand I appreciate your it's not a council function. I, I understand your sentiments, in there, but I'm not sure whether it's a, something that falls under... Sorry, I'll, 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 I'll just make the comment, I'll, if Ruth can perhaps take it up um, on an informal basis, not wanting to put into a recommendation on the committee, if that helps. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry. No, I don't think we, we work in, we've been working with, uh, with Brew Kitchen. It's a matter for them in terms of the employment issues. Not for us, obviously, it's regrettable that's happened, but we are continuing with, with, with those discussions. And I would also say that we're really committed to, you know, working with the Friends Group in terms of developing further proposals. We've said that right from the outset when we did that, and we've had lots of conversations with them, and everything that we've done over the last 90 days or so, you know, has been put on the Council's website. I've tried to answer all of the questions as diligently as we possibly can, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. So, we have the recommendation in front of us. Uh, are we all in agreement with the recommendations as set out with the additional... Any, any dissension from that or will any? Yeah, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, there's no further business on the agenda. We will be looking forward to looking and setting up a further further meeting and going through. I'd just like to thank the, the, the members of the public that come along today, the questions uh, and, and the comments in there. There will be the debate at, at full council next week uh, when the petition is presented and I'm, I'm sure some of these things will, will come up again and, and We've rehearsed them today and go through the arguments of the discussion again next week. But uh, there may be other things, and if there are things that, that when they present the petition, if there are other other options that are considered that want to be considered, then you know, if, with with the presentation of the petition, that's the opportunity to get that in there as well, and it goes on to the formal record, which which may help us. Ajman, sure. Can I just be clear that we've agreed the recommendation for delegation to myself in terms of. So yeah, we, include, we included that in there. Uh, and it will include myself, Council Williams, uh, and Councillor Johnson in, in consultation. Thank you very much. That's the, uh, the end of the meeting. Thank you.